Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's the Historical Gamer again, and I'm playing another battle in Ultimate General Gettysburg. This is part 6, but I'm not great at math, nor simple arithmetic apparently. Uh, if I'm wrong, then again, that's because I'm not great with math. Uh, that's a pretty lame excuse, right? I should be able to add. Anyway, um, in this version of Ultimate General Gettysburg, we're going to be playing the July 3rd battle. Either Pickett's Charge, the historical attack on the Union Center, a attack on the Union left, which would be an attack on um, Little Round Top, or an attack on the Union right, which would be an attack on Culp's Hill. Now, both of these are ahistorical, although there was an attack on the right. It wasn't uh, the main focus of the Confederate attack on July 3rd, which is where we're at. The historical attack was on the Union Center, led by General Pickett uh, and General Trimble and Anderson, was it? Um, so there were three Confederate divisions who were under General Longstreet who launched that attack on the third day. And we haven't really played any historical battles since the very first one. All the others have been some kind of uh, ahistorical variant. So I want to go ahead and try that one. We're going to go ahead and play the attack on the Union Center. So you see here, uh, the Confederacy actually is going to have a numerical advantage, which I'm kind of surprised about. I've won the majority of the battles that I've fought, uh, but somehow, uh, inexplicably, despite taking Little Round Top, Cemetery Ridge, Cemetery Hill, and Culp's Hill, I'm back on Seminary Ridge, about to attack the Union Center under Pickett's charge. Uh, we start with 22,364 soldiers and 213 guns against 27,000... Union soldiers and 166 guns. We are expecting 11,000 reinforcements, uh, which will give us a slight numerical advantage. Uh, although the train we have to attack across is going to be very difficult. So let's go ahead and fight here. Um, where are my soldiers? So I've got a bunch of artillery shooting at something. Can't see what. Everything is all fogged out. Where are my troops? It said I started with 22,000 soldiers, didn't it? Where is everyone? There's a second corps. This is bizarre. I've got one regiment on the field. I mean, I get that there was a historical artillery barrage. Is that what this is representing? Or is this some kind of glitch where my units aren't showing up on the screen? Yeah, this is... This is weird. Just look, I just click here. Oh, Ambrose Wright. I think I got a glitch here. Um, what is going on? <laughs> uh, should we should we launch the attack? <laughs> um, let's see what happens if I if I abort the battle. Let's go back to continue. There we go. All right, so we've got our troops on the screen now. That was kind of funny. Um. Yeah. Anyway, so we've got a lot of troops here on the screen. Uh, the Union has a very strong position, but they do look kind of weak in the center. Historically, the Confederates launched an attack with about 15,000 men across this open ground after a long artillery barrage. I talked in my last video a little bit about how the artillery uh, was less effective for the Confederates due to unreliable fuses, and that may be one reason that the artillery barrage, which lasted over two hours and contained more than 200 artillery pieces, may not have been as effective as it could have been. Um, thanks in large part to uh, most of the artillery fire, fire uh, sailing over the Union lines. In fact, the Confederacy actually um, thought they were doing better than they were for a few reasons. Union artillery began withdrawing from some of the ridges, uh, which were across from the Confederates, to give the appearance of Confederate successful artillery barrages. In addition to that, uh, the Union also had an artillery or uh, artillery ammunition wagon get hit in the early stages of the bombardment, causing a lot of smoke and explosions uh, that seemed to indicate to the Confederates that a lot of damage was being done by the Union artillery barrage. This was not the case, although the uh, damage that was done did cause Union forces to run low on ammunition, so they also began to conserve ammunition as the attack went on which meant that Confeder er, Confederates were seeing Union artillery fire slacken, slow up, and they were also seeing um, the 
intentional deception of various units being pulled out of the actual uh, positions. So this kind of lull, lulled, I can't speak, lulled the Confederates into a sense of belief that their artillery barrage were having some effect or some positive effects uh, when it really wasn't doing all that much. You know, obviously losing an artillery wagon with some ammunition on it, causing you to slacken your fire, that's good for, for the attacker, but it wasn't enough. Um, it also looks like here we get uh, General Early's uh, core as well, so we're kind of we kind of have the whole Confederate center and and left here we can launch attacks with, and that's what I'm going to do. I want to keep the Union pinned as much as I can, and uh, let's do that. Here we're going to launch. We don't have, have enough men probably to take this ridge, but we're going to try anyway. It's probably the last battle in this whole dang thing, so. Uh, there's no reason to conserve troops. You know, in other battles you might conserve soldiers because casualties do carry over. I feel like I'm mentioning that in every single video, but it is important to note. You know, what you do in one battle will affect you in the next if your casualties are too heavy. Fortunately for me, most of these troops haven't been deployed yet. Uh, Mahone's division has lost, or brigade's lost quite a bit. Scales, not so much. So we're engaged here on the southern end of the map. Uh, we're kind of pushing into the Union. They've advanced their troops off of uh, Cemetery Ridge into the open, so that's good for me. It also allows my artillery to kind of get some canister fire in on them and hopefully do some damage. Um, although I don't apparently have infantry guarding that artillery, so that's not good. Um, yeah, I don't know why the Union is advancing against my forces, but it seems foolhardy because they have some pretty darn strong defenses uh, which they can hide behind. But hey, I won't complain. Um... Pickett's Charge is really an interesting, interesting fight, if you will, uh, to me. It's mytho It has a, a huge mythos surrounding of it, and uh, one of the guys who gets a lot of attention is General Pickett, but he was not the only division commander. Uh, Generals Trimble, I believe it was, and Anderson also had their, their commands involved in the attack. Pickett gets a lot of press because he was a Virginian, and the Virginian press uh, kind of dominated post-war Civil War, so they kind of played up the contribution of the only major general, I believe, from Virginia. Uh, you know, General Lee was, I believe, a lieutenant general, but he was the only major general commanding a division in the Army of the Potomac at this time, anyway. And um, so he gets a lot of press for that. He was also a very flamboyant and charismatic character. He dressed exceptionally well, and he... Um, he was just kind of a very, like I said, a very flamboyant character. So that's another reason he gets a lot of attention, as the Union is crushing my left flank. Oh, no! No! Okay, that regiment's retreating. This one's retreating. Okay, good, good, good. So things may stabilize a bit now. That's good. Um, so the Union looks like they're launching an attack kind of on the southern part of the map, where I've got very little troops. I had a lot of artillery, and it looks like a lot of that got pushed back. In the center, I'm having some more success. We have driven toward the stone wall, where historically the Confederates got. It was the furthest point of their advance uh, during the battle, um, and, or at least in the attack. It was actually led by General Armistead's brigade. Uh, Armistead got further than any other uh, commander. But uh, again, Pickett was kind of lionized uh, as a result of his involvement. I find it interesting, though, because I watched the bat or I watched the movie Gettysburg. And they really kind of play Pickett up as this naive young officer with very little experience in the Civil War and eager to get into battle and fight and all of that. And while some of that's true, he was certainly flamboyant. He was certainly uh, eager to be involved in a fight where he really hadn't done much with his command of his division. He was heavily engaged in the first early years of the war. So he wasn't some guy who missed out on all the fighting. This was his first chance to get involved in, in a real big fight. You know, he was central in the attacks on Gaines Mill in 1862 where he was severely wounded and uh, involved in, in driving the Union back. That's how he got his command of his division. He was also involved in the battles of Williamsburg and uh, was it Seven Pines uh, shortly before Gaines Mill. So he was a veteran of at least three full-scale army engagements uh, in which he played a big role in and, and that kind of doesn't seem to come off that way in the movie Gettysburg. Uh, so that's one thing that I find not annoying, but a little bit inaccurate, and I, again, that type of stuff does kind of bug me a little bit. Um, you know, it'd be nice to see the effort being put in uh, to to getting things right, especially when so much is is you know. You, you don't need this naive young division commander. He was flamboyant and enough of a character in of himself uh, to to kind of carry that role without, I guess, just making stuff up. 
Um, you can see here the Union is now kind of counterattacking here on the le left center. We've stabilized things on our far right flank, the Union left. Uh, they are really threatening our center, though. Hopefully this artillery can kind of slow them down. Doesn't seem like artillery does a whole lot. You know, see that artillery round fired, not a single man killed or wounded. Um, hopefully this ridge line I can use as kind of a defense. We do have the high ground at least. Union's kind of launching a pickets charge of their own. We're launching a pickets charge. Uh, we are driving them back here at the center. It's worth 15,000 victory points. That's crazy! Um, this little area where Armistead is was the historical limit of the Confederate advance. Um, but I'm worried because I've got all these brigades down here. I need my reinforcements. Where are they? Um, I'm having some success over here in our culp so it looks like. So at least we'll keep the Union troops busy uh, so they can't just immediately come in and face me and, and ro run me off the field. Um, driving those guys back. Armistead's getting close to the objective point. Uh, we're kind of at the high water mark, if you will. Union uh, infantry is being driven back a little bit, probably by this massive concentration of artillery. They have to be hurting the morale, but you saw like five explosions in there. One guy killed. Again, that's just kind of symbolic of the, the poor effect that Confederate artillery had. But again, artillery fire, I imagine, I haven't guess I guess I haven't taken too close of a look, but I imagine it also impacts morale as well. So it's not strictly um, about casualties. Go ahead and move scales up here. We're getting really close to this objective point, so I really hope we can we can take it. Maybe we can win the battle, win the war for the the South. Um, Gordon's getting pushed back here. Jones is going to advance. Uh, we're going to move this guy, General Yule, over here. And I have a lot of guys on that side. We'll move Pettigrew down here to kind of deal with Lockwood. And maybe Wilcox's, some of these guys maybe can, can rally a bit. Wolford's brigade is in good shape. Kershaw's brigade is in good shape. We'll go ahead and advance these guys on the south to keep Union troops pinned. Um... Guys, you need to gain more more morale more quickly. Come on, let's go. So, uh, at this point, I have to think I'm pushing the Union back more for morale. Uh, looks like casualties. you got a lot of dead bodies here. A lot of dead blue coats. That artillery must be helping me out. Um, there must have been some canister fire or something like that. But we got a ton of guns in there, so if we can use them, we should have some success. Here's Armistead. Uh, he's uh, pretty close to the objective point. Scales is moving in that direction as well. And uh, if we can take it, we'll be all set. Don't you dare retreat, Armistead. You hold your ground. Lane's going to come up to support you. Von Gleeses was shattered the first day of the battle. I think I, I nearly destroyed him like three different times. Um, Thomas, get up there. I need all my guys. I need all my boys. And no, I'm not trying to do a southern accent. I'm just making weird voices. So, yeah. Mahone will advance, Pettigrew advance, Kemper advance. Kemper. I think Kemper was killed. Is he the guy in the movie Gettysburg who's on his horse who refuses to walk because he's got some kind of leg injury? Gets himself killed. I'm sure that was a apocryphal story. Um, when Pickett's Charge historically failed, uh, the Confederates, when they were retreating, um, General Lee rode out amongst them, basically coming up and saying, this is all my fault. Uh, he supposedly told General Pickett to reform his division, and uh, Pickett said, basically, I don't have a division. There is some controversy over whether Pickett ever, I don't know if forgave is the right word, but maybe got over uh, his involvement in Pickett's charge. Um, he certainly was, was uh, suffering as a result of probably some PTSD uh, after that attack. Uh, if you kind of read about the description of how he handled that, he was shattered by the, the destruction that his division suffered uh, personally. And um, there's, there's, some, there's some historians, I guess there was a, one, one of his aides after the war, uh, kind of said that he never forgave Lee, that they met Lee years later, and that it was a very cold reception, and um, essentially to the effect of him, him after the meeting turning to his aide and telling him that Lee had murdered his division. Um, but most historians don't seem to buy into that. There's some controversy around that. 
Um, also, some of his post-war, some of his legacy that we know today may also be shaped by the fact that his wife, who was, I think, 20 when she married him, he was something like 38 and she was 20, um, supposedly she met him when he, she was 9. Take that for what it will. I don't know if that's true or not. But that's supposedly the case. Uh, was a author and historian after the war, and she spent a lot of her time and legacy basically defending uh, Pickett, kind of turning into this mythology or mythological kind of perfect Southern gentleman and officer. Uh, supposedly, he was uh, vastly appalled by slavery and opposed to it, but he was fighting for Virginia. Um, you hear that a lot about a lot of Confederate officers, and I really wonder what what the case is. You know, how many of them really had that sense? Because so many of these soldiers came from aristocratic Southern families, and so many of them were ingratiated and, and you know, in incredibly tied into Southern culture. You have to wonder how much of that is post-war uh, kind of um, revisionist history saying, oh, well, of course, they were all opposed to slavery. They were just fighting for their homes. You know, how much of that was kind of the revisionist history that came up, came about after the war? I'm not saying all of it was. Because I do think there probably were some soldiers who were just fighting for what they viewed as their home and just, you know, against what they viewed as an invasion of their state, which it was. You know, the Union Army did invade the southern states and uh, without without permission. And if you hold to the concept of, of states being sovereign, which many people do, even to this day, states having some, you know, rights that the, the federal government, the Constitution says that the federal government can't take all of these rights away. So... One second. We just got... Nice. So General Stewart has sent Fitzhall Lee's brigade to support us. So we've got some cavalry brigades coming in behind the Union lines. Um, but anyway, so if you kind of support this idea that a lot of Confederate officers were opposed to slavery, you have to wonder if, if that's the case. How many of them really did? Because look at it this way. If a huge percentage of the Southern military officers were opposed to slavery and thought it was wrong, why did all the political leadership seem to have a totally different view? And if that's the case, a lot of these people have a lot of political sway, a lot of political influence, and if all these important people that we revere today were against slavery, how could it ex have existed in the South? How could it have continued to exist without the support of apparently anyone except the political leaders of the South? Because there was, there's not much effort to say the, the politicians in the South were opposed to slavery. And I guess you could say, well, it was all the business tycoons. You know, they didn't want to lose out. They didn't want to lose their quote-unquote property, as they believed it was. But I'm not sure I buy it. Um, again, I'm not saying that officers were actively saying, we want slavery. But I think when you grow up in a culture that that is kind of the status symbol of what, what makes... Uh, what makes you in society, how you're successful in society, and it's something you grew up with and are always around. Sure, maybe after the war, maybe even during the war, you're like, eh, this isn't a great idea, but I don't think that immediately makes you willing to say this is wrong. And I don't know. I just, it seems unlikely to me that as many officers as we're told about today were opposed to it as actually were. I guess in order to buy that, I would have to see writing from early in the war uh, from, from some of these characters that either they were opposed to it. I would have to see something basically in, in writing before the tide clearly turned up against the Confederacy, you know, probably 1862, where they said, listen, uh, slavery's wrong. We shouldn't have it. You, sh you show me that and I'll believe it. There are a couple of officers I've seen who, who have some of those writings. Um, or, you know, there's evidence that before the war they really were against slavery. But again, I, I don't know how much of it I buy. Yeah, we're coming in behind the Union lines. We're going to destroy these boys. We got one cavalry battalion. The artillery reserve is going to be doomed. We're going to charge these boys. Holy crap, there's 400. Charge! -na 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 so 600 cavalry charging 400 artillery pieces that cannot fire back. Destroy him! I guess we'll see. I've never launched a cavalry charge before. The one time that I saw a cavalry charge, it was a uh, Union Vedettes uh, versus some of my men. So... They're not doing much. Just kind of... Kind of running around. Gotta keep the pressure up, boys. Keep it up. 
So my, my boys have to be close to their ropes in terms of how much they can do fighting-wise. But I have to think so, so are theirs. This unit has great morale. They should come around here. Bring the coal up and bring Stonewall Brigade over. Union has flanked me a bit. They do... Oh my goodness. Now they're moving towards Seminary Ridge. Knock them out. Artillery, you're right there. Shoot at them. Hello? Halt. There you go. Ames is... Fortunately, the brigade they sent there was beat to hell in the first day or two of the fighting. Garnett needs to pull back. They've got three brigades coming at me at my positions. Ames was really torn to shreds the first day or two of the of the war. I don't have any reserves to stop these guys. These are all look like they're part of the 11th Corps, though, in my recollection. I think I lose if I lose somebody here. Hell, it's it's less victory points, but it seems to me that it's probably one of those points you can't you can't lose. And again, I'm not saying that. Again, I, just clearing up what I said earlier. I don't think that every single Southern officer was in favor of slavery. That's not the case. But I just I'm not sure I buy as many were against it as supposedly is the case. I'm sure some of them were, but some of it also might have been kind of revisionist history to make yourself look better in the after effect of a, of a defeated, you know, defeated army. But what do I know? I'm from Wisconsin, so I'm clearly a northern boy, right? I will say my favorite uh, Civil War commander was Longstreet for quite a long time. I really like Longstreet, really like Hancock. Claiborne out west was just uh, someone that I, I think admire as far as a military kind of uh, figure. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I'd say I like more of the southern commanders than I like of the northern commanders, but... That's just me. So this battle looks like it's about to end, and it has. We've won a major victory. We lost fewer men. The enemy lost about 600 more men than us. We took Cemetery Ridge and Seminary Ridge, cut off the Union Army, and they were on the verge of defeat. So let's see what happens here. We won a major victory at the end of July 3rd. So we have won the Battle of Gettysburg. We took 65,000 victory points to the Union 15,000. We did lose more men than them. We lost 26,000 men. They lost 24,000. But the Union Army is shattered. Congratulations, General. You've managed to crash the Yankees and win the Battle of Gettysburg. Crash? It probably should be crush, right? Um, your name will be on the lip of every Southerner, and you'll be written into history in gold. Our victorious Army of Northern Virginia can march to Washington and dictate peace terms to the European... Oh my goodness, can't read. Our victorious army of Northern Virginia can march to Washington and dictate peace terms, and the Europeans will most likely support our cause. Soon the war will be over with a triumph for our confederation. I don't know if I buy that. Newt Gingrich, whether you like his politics or not, wrote an interesting series of books about a hypothetical crushing victory by the Confederacy at the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, or uh, I think it was Pipe Creek is where the actual battle would take place. Which, interestingly enough, there's a Scourge of War DLC for that battle. Um, but the Union still had something like 20,000 soldiers in Washington. Uh, in this battle, the Confederacy would have started with 75,000. We lose 26,000 casualties. We're down to 50,000 troops. Put 20,000 Union soldiers behind huge fortifications, the most fortified area in the world. And I don't think you march right into Washington, especially because I doubt we destroyed the entire Union army here. Uh, if, you know, 40,000, 30,000 retreat, then they outnumber us. All they need to do is shift some troops from the west. They've got troops further north. Uh, politically, maybe. Uh, a triumph at Gettysburg wins um, the, the war. I also don't know if the Europeans really are going to intervene at this point after the Emancipation Proclamation has already occurred. The British most likely are not going to support a slaveholding state. The French might, but they won't do it without British support. So, anyway, we won the battle. Hooray! Uh, took six parts. There's something like 30 scenarios, so there's still quite a bit of the, the battle we didn't get to see as far as the game's concerned. I might do another Let's Play of the Union, maybe, perhaps, possibly, if this that's something that you guys might be interested in. But uh, anyway, uh, that's going to do it for the series. Thanks for tuning in, guys. I really appreciate it. If you uh, like this, please throw a like down, comment, jibbity-jabber, all that normal stuff. And uh, let me know what you want to see me do next. Should I do a Union uh, Let's Play? Should I just play some of the other battles? I can't yet. I guess I've got to unlock them by playing them in the first place. Um, and I don't know about intentionally losing other fights. But hey, 
we'll see what happens. Uh, we won the war. That's what matters. We won the battle. That's what matters. And everything else is gravy. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching. And again, this is the Historical Gamer signing out.